My name is Charlie Stodd and I'm co-president of the Nantucket Civic League, a federation of 24 neighborhood associations with about 2000 members. The Civic League's purpose is to advance continuous improvement in the quality of life on Nantucket by identifying important and emerging issues, informing the community about them, and helping to build consensus on solutions. I'm pleased to welcome all of you, as well as the viewers of Nantucket Cable TV Channel 18, to today's virtual forum entitled Chapter 91, The Public Waterfront Act. Before I turn this forum over to Vice President Lee Saperstein, who will moderate, I'd like to call upon Frank Shaw, our co-pilot from Nantucket Cable TV Channel 18, to explain how the question and answer segments of the forum will work. And incidentally, uh, this forum is being recorded and will be available on demand on Channel 18. Now, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Civic League Vice President Lee Saperstein, our moderator for today's forum. Lee? Charlie, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Lee. Uh, my parents were smart enough to have a three letter first name to go with the eight or 10, 10 or 11 letter last name. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce our various speakers. They've all given me uh, biographical information and cruelly I've cut it down so that we would have enough time for questions and answers. We're gonna begin with my good friend and colleague, Alan Reinhardt. Uh, Alan for years was the Middle Moors Ranger for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, where he led walks through uh, the properties. And that's how we first met. Alan is also a director of the Nantucket Island Land Bank. Uh, he's a director of the Wanakamet Water Company. Uh, he's chair of the Committee on Roads and Right-of-Way and chair of the uh, Cemetery Commission, both of which on which uh, I serve. Um, I'm the note taker and Alan is the guiding light. So um, for sure, Rhodes and Right Away have been talking for some time about chapter 91 and Alan, um, it's yours. Thank you, Lee. Um, my role here is to do a brief history of chapter 91, also known as the, um, um, the, the, uh, the, the Public Waterfront Act. And basically um, this chapter 91 in the general laws of Massachusetts lays down the rules governing public use and protection of the Commonwealth's tidelands and waterways. Now, what that means is um, this, this law has roots in what's called the public trust doctrine. And this doctrine goes back, it's basically a philosophy that goes back over 2000 years to Roman times. And it holds that the air, the sea, the shore belong to the public and uh, at large and not to any particular individual. Um, this, the public trust doctrine was um, upheld by the Supreme Court in 1842. They made a ruling and they made a second ruling in 1897, uh, which established the public trust doctrine. Now, when Massachusetts Bay Colony was organized, they adopted the colonial ordinances, they're referred to as the colonial ordinances of 1841 to 1847. They codified this doctrine, the public doctrine, to oversee the development of Boston's increasingly busy and expanding requirements as a major port city the protection and public use of the colony's tidelands and waterways was um, the intent of these early rules and regulations. The procedures of chapter 91 adopted in 1866 through the land court 
and they are um, they are part of the, the Massachusetts general laws under this chapter 91. Now, it's one of the oldest programs of its kind in the, this nation. Uh, the law regulates activities um, both on coastal and inland waterways, including construction, dredging, the filling in of tidelands, and it also includes the great ponds and certain rivers and streams of the Commonwealth. Through chapter 91, the Commonwealth then seeks to preserve and protect the rights of the public and to guarantee the private uses of tidelands and waterways and to make sure that uh, the public, uh, I'm sorry, the private uses serve a proper public uh, purpose. Now, it's the Mass Department of Environmental Protection uh, through which the waterways, or, th or through its waterways regulation program oversees Chapter 91, and it's the primary division charged with implementing um, and, and uh, well, of basically of implementing this public trust doc, um, doctrine. So the Waterways Protection Program does a couple of things. It preserves pedestrian access to the water's edge for fishing, fouling, and navigation. And in return for permission to develop non-water dependent uses, uh, it is charged with implementing this public trust uh, doctrine. And the waterways regulation program does a number of things. It provides uh, pedestrian access to the water's edge, as I said, for fishing, following, and navigation. Uh, it seeks to protect and extend public strolling rights as well as public navigation rights. It protects, promotes, uh, and promotes tidelands as a workplace for commercial fishing shipping, passenger transportation, building and repair, marinas, and other activities for which proximity to the water is essential and highly um, advantageous. It also assures the removal or repair of unsafe or hazardous structures in uh, the, the, our tidelands and um, the water and waterways protects critical environment, ocean sanctuaries, and other sensitive areas. It also encourages the development of city, town, um, city and town harbor plans with regulations uh, to protect traditional maritime industries from being displaced by commercial or residential development. So um, what activities require a chapter 91 license. Basically, it's any activity that occurs in, on, over, or under the tidal waters seaward of the mean high tide line to the three mile state limit. So any activity occurring within those uh, tidelands um, is, it requires, um, a, well, with certain exceptions, requires a permit. Um, any activity in the filled tide lands, former, which are the former submerged lands and the tidal flats that have been replaced by fill. Also, any activity on a great pond having a surface greater than 10 acres in its natural state. Nantucket has seven great ponds. Um, Cascada, Gibbs Pond, Hummock, Long Pond, Mayakamet Pond, Sasakaja, and Tom Nevers Pond. The seven uh, great ponds that are recognized by the state. There has been some interesting history here in that the 
uh, Nantucket was originally part of New York State, and it wasn't transferred to Massachusetts until 1675. So there is some question regarding um, the Nantucket's uh, oversight of uh, the great ponds here. So um, other activities include the placement of any structures, construction or alteration of any structure, regardless of the size, whether it's permanent or seasonal, any dredging, filling or change in use, um, structural alteration, demolition of structures, other activities that cause a change in the water level of the great ponds and of course burning of rubbish. Um, water dependent and or non-water dependent use determines the type of chapter 91 license required. Non-water dependent uses include hotels, restaurants, residences, office buildings, things like that. Water dependent uses include wharves, marina, sea walls, revetments, piers, floats, etc. So waterways, waterways regulations encourage the use of waterfront for water dependent uses, which are presumed to have a proper public purpose. And uh, non-water dependent projects must provide greater benefits than the detriments to the public rights of way. An example of this would be the restrooms that uh, the Dreamland had to make available to the public as uh, they own, um, as part of their property extends uh, into the field tidelands areas. And therefore they were required to provide a public benefit, uh, which is again, the whole purpose of these chapter 91 regulations. Um, other public benefits obtained through chapter 91 uh, include pedestrian and waterfront walkways, strolling rights in intertidal uh, areas, dinghy docks, public restrooms, creation of park, fishing piers, public sailing programs, and other, um, other items such as that. So that's a brief history of chapter 91 and some of the overriding um, concerns that the law deals with. Alan, thank you. That was uh, very thorough. I can imagine some of our later speakers are looking at their uh, written out material and crossing stuff off because you've already covered it. Um, if I may, Alan, you said 1841 when indeed the colonial ordinances were 1641 and 1647. 16. Correct. Now, uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I'm going to alert our attendees that um, we will have a question and answer period for Alan and Jeff Carlson. Uh, Jeff's coming up next. So, uh, Jeff, get ready. Jeff Carlson is director of our Department of Natural Resources. He's been on island for a good part of his career. Uh, dealing with um, natural resources, which include, uh, he's the staff uh, person for the Conservation Commission. He deals with all uh, land uh, issues on the waterfront. For example, if you recall the signs that say beach access, that those kinds of things come out of his office. Um, Jeff has a degree from Purdue um, came here, um, you'll have to tell us when. Um, Mrs. Carlson, I, I think she goes by her family name, is very involved with Moorzan Farm. So when you're buying corn from Moorzan, you're helping out our Jeff. Jeff, it's up to you. Is he there? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lee. Thank you so much. Uh, I do have a presentation that I'll, I'll share with everybody. Uh, that has some visual aids to it. So I'll try to uh, hopefully share my screen and hopefully everyone can see that okay. It's coming up. Uh, if you could expand, we're, we're good to go. Yep. All right. Uh, 
See if I can. When I say expand, if you could go into slideshow mode to eliminate the panels on the left, it'll make your slide. There we go. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Perfect. All right. So, like Lee said, hi. My name is Jeff Carlson. I'm the Town of Nantucket's Natural Resources Director, and uh, you're responsible for our, our shellfish program and water quality and conservation commission and a lot of things that are there. And one of the offices that we work a lot with is also with the Harbor Master's Office that really has a, a big part in our waterways management for moorings. Um, and we'll fess up that they maintain most of the public access signs at this point, but we all kind of work hand in hand uh, to help ensure public access. So uh, like Lee said, I have the, the great distinction of going after Alan. And since Alan jumped into a few topics of my presentation already, I'll try to get through them a little bit quicker and try to get into a little bit more detail on a few of them. And I was asked today to speak specifically about how chapter 91 works and how we're gonna kind of approach that from a local level on Nantucket. And then hopefully uh, our later presenters, Carlos and Steve can really get into the nuts and bolts of it because they are the people that I call when I have questions or, or concerns and they always know the answers. So hopefully they'll, they'll be able to help us out a little bit as well. So like Alan had said, the Public Waterfront Act is you know, one of our oldest pieces of legislation. And I think it's important to note that all of the time because it was something where you know, the citizens of the Commonwealth really identified early that maintaining everyone's access to, to, you know, to the water sheet to go fish for food um, or, or hunt birds or even just to go bird watching and get onto our shoreline and onto our water sheets was really a critical part of being in, in the Commonwealth and in Massachusetts and that as people started to privatize the, the abutting land, the maintaining that access was so important. And I, I think it's important to note that it's, you know, from the, the mid 1800s and 1866, that the part that I deal with the most is, is the order of conditions and through the Conservation Commission, the act that enabled that, the Wetlands Protection Act didn't come in until 1972. So we were almost a hundred years late to the game for protecting our wetland resource areas uh, but have been working on maintaining public access for that entire time and even before then. So it's something that's, you know, kind of ingrained in, in us here in Massachusetts and is really important to maintain going forward. And it's really just providing that, you know, that vital link. So you see a lot of projects that come in for, uh, you know, anything from, from docks and piers, like you see here on, on one of the land bank pieces, uh, that's great public use or, you know, petrol landing or other uses that are there. But as people, you know, Restrict access somewhat, still providing that public component is an important part of the discussion. So to get into a little bit more detail from what Alan had talked about, the main areas that we have for protection are obviously flow tidelands. Um, a real obvious example of flow tidelands would be an area like, be like the creeks, somewhere that, um, you know, the water flows in and out, it's tidal. Uh, but if there was work to be done in there, whether it's, you know, dredging or, uh, a dock or pier, something that's there that would require licensure through chapter 91. And at the local level here, the first step would probably be to reach out to your local conservation commission, find out if a permit is needed from them because that order of conditions is going to be required to ultimately be able to file for that chapter 91 license. In most of those cases, it's on the first page of the application, you have to fill that information in. So that's your best spot to start. Um, filled timelines, which we'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide, is kind of the trickiest for people and is probably also the area uh, that on Nantucket at least, the area where there are more unlicensed structures uh, than we probably should have and stuff that gets passed over because it's not something that's often thought about uh, right off the jump. The Great Ponds, obviously any work in the Great Ponds for, you know, Sacagawea, Gibbs, Cascada, Tom Nevers, and Maya Comet. Uh, any work that happens within those ponds, there's a good chance it'll require chapter 91 licensure, whether it's a, a, a dock or pier. Again, there's some prohibitions on that, but just a, a classic example that our department has is we hold two chapter 91 licenses to be able to open Hummock and Sackage Pond during the times of year that we do. So we have licenses uh, to deal with those. And then there's also non-tidal rivers or streams. That's not something that typically applies to Nantucket too much. We don't have any um, as the Wetland Protection Act defines it, any riverfront area on Nantucket. So um, that's something for us that isn't overly applicable, but if you happen to own property or on the mainland, it, it certainly may apply. And I would speak to your local officials there. 
But Phil Tylens, this is kind of the, the trickiest part, and it's the part that I get asked about the most here for knowing where it is. And the slide that I put up here, it's a little bit hopefully easier to see because you can kind of see the Easy Street Basin that's here. And then you see this, hopefully you can follow my pointer, um, the cool like yellow to yellow orange line that's here. Those are what, uh, through the Morris CZM viewer, they've mapped as the chapter 91 jurisdiction line. So that's obviously the best place to start. It's an online accessible database for people uh, that gets maintained by the Commonwealth. And it's a really great source of information. So our classic example of stuff that, that can be missed and that wasn't um, and a good catch. And, and I'm glad that Alan mentioned earlier as well. You can see where Oak Street is and the yellow line that runs through, that runs right through the middle of the Dreamland Theater. So when the Dreamland Theater was reconstructed a few years ago and, and rebuilt, they had to get a chapter 91 license because that activity is taking place on what's filled Thailand. And I think if anyone goes back uh, and if someone wants a lot of information on it, I'm sure Hillary, who's going to speak later, or someone like Holly Backus can show information of what that basin used to look like before it was filled and you know when the railroad went through there and some of the other areas and the old fish laps that were down there. But as they filled that area in, that makes that area subject to protection under chapter 91. So when the dreamland was being rebuilt, they obviously can't provide a public walkway down to the, down to the waterfront. They had to get a little bit more creative and, and work with waterways. And what they were able to provide through their licensure is that nice brick park that's behind uh, that provides some, some open space in the back, but they also are required to have, like Alan said, restrooms that are available to the public for certain times and dates uh, to provide that public benefit since they can't provide that direct water access that other can. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. If you're not sure if you're in Phil Thailand, if you own a house downtown or around the island, I would check the viewer first. If you can't get it from there, sometimes you can look back at the title history for your lot. There's a great website, uh, masslandrecords.com. You can look up anyone's title information, so their deed or certificate, whether it's registered or unregistered land. Um, and from there, if you drift back a little bit, you might find something called a license and plan, and it may have been an old license. Uh, licenses have a pretty long life, and, and sometimes they get forgotten over time, but it's certainly a great resource to do. Or even ask you know, your, your local surveyor or engineer that may have been working on your property, whether it's for you know, a septic system redo or just an addition or property line determination. They're great resources. If you're working with legal counsel, they also have people on staff that can help you. Um, but Phil Tylens is definitely the trickiest and the one that, that we typically find is the most often missed. And if you do feel like you require a license and you're not sure, please feel free to reach out to our office and we'll try to get in touch with the people that, that can help you or, or talk about maybe trying to come into to a license or, or being able to, to properly license your property going forward. So like Alan said, what needs a, a permit? And I'll list all the things on the side there, so I won't go through them again. But what I wanted to put up here and kind of show the importance of this is a typical chapter 91 plan is kind of what I put to the side. And I chose this property specifically because I know it just sold to the land bank, so no one would get bent out of shape with me when I was showing off their house and plan. Um, but this is Mickey Rowland's office down at the end of Commercial Wharf. And this is one where it's kind of an interesting site because part of the site is, is flowed uh, during the regular tidelands and some of it is unfilled. So it required that chapter 91 license. And what they ended up with was a kind of a creative solution where you can see it labeled where there's a public open space behind the house that abuts Petrol Landing. There's a, a public access way that runs along the side and then they included a bench, so somewhere you could sit. And this is the kind of thing that when they review your Chapter 91 application, they get a detailed plan that shows all of the information that shows historic water lines, current water lines, um, what's proposed, what's existing. And it's a really comprehensive look. And a lot of these plan sets are three and four sheets long that Waterways reviews, and they do a, a really nice job looking at the project as a whole and determining the best way to provide that public benefit to ensure that people can still access the water sheet. So even in a limited area like Commercial Wharf, where you're just kind of coming around the corner into a vacant space as you go towards the town pier, this house and even the one next door both hold licenses where there's some level of public access to cross the property for the purpose, you know, the purpose of you know fishing and fowling and navigating and all of the things that are protected. 
and I'm kind of interested to see as the land bank moves through the process, obviously taking a structure off or dealing with it or turning it into another use will require an, either an update or a new license um, that will include those components as well. So this is kind of what a typical plan looks like. There's a, another margin or two that go around. This is kind of the snapshot, but this is a plan that you're gonna need a, a professional surveyor or engineer to do, it needs to be stamped. Uh, you don't always require a plan of this detail, uh, but this project did. So again, we're happy to help determine what that is, or uh, I'm sure Carlos would be happy to, to help as well. And what we're really looking to get at here is, is you know, what the public benefit is. So there are lots of these sneaky signs all over the place and I know people see, and. Uh, my chapter 91 involvement out here usually involves someone calling me and saying a sign was taken down or a walkway was blocked. And, you know, usually can call someone and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, you know, I would hate to have to call up to the state level and, and get some enforcement. But these are some really great examples of, of projects that came in. So a controversial project in front of the Conservation Commission was the uh, construction of the Great Harbor Yacht Club in the mid 2000s. And really one of the great public benefits that came out of that um, aside from some of the access to the, you know, the travel lift, the docks that were to be included. This is a really great pedestrian walkway that goes around that property and kind of connects down onto the beach that runs along Washington Street. And they're required to mark this. So if you go onto the front of their, their, their building, they have a nice sign that says public pedestrian access. Uh, and then they, license, they list the license specifically. And then if you go around the property, you can see all these cool little ran at pedestrian walkway signs with arrows to navigate around the property. So for that use and, and having that kind of exclusive access to the, to the water there, having their peer system that was put in, they were also able to provide this public walkway that they, they have to keep open and it's open 24 hours a day. Uh, I've fully fess up that sometimes it's awkward to go through when there are people you know, eating or having a cocktail outside, but it's certainly welcome to the public and people are, are welcome to go through. And chapter 91 is what provides that access and what is protected by it. And the other sign I have up is, I think everyone's probably gone by the Dreamland once or twice and seen this on the outside. But if you read the fine print, they also have to reference their license and, and that's what keeps it there. So there are all kinds of sneaky little access points all over the island. Some of the other ones include uh, down by the White Elephant, you're able to walk kind of to where their boats uh, come into their slips. There's a public walkway that's there that connects over to some adjacent properties. And there's all kinds of little corridors that are there that are all supposed to be marked. Uh, some of the other great projects that provided, you know, through chapter 91 public access uh, for the boat basin, the, uh, the large lot in front of the stop and shop is licensed by chapter 91. Uh, and that's what is able to maintain most of that as public so it can't be converted to private. Uh, I know some of the, the spaces there are, are marked private but a majority of that lot has to remain public as required by their chapter 91 license. So there's lots of great benefits that aren't necessarily direct water access, uh, but it's there. And some of the other ones, I tried to get a picture, but they're, they're not in right now. There are a number of you know, existing docks, uh, you know, Jimmy Stewart's Pier in Monomoy comes to mind that during the season when the ramp is in place, they also include stairways to get up and over that dock. So there's no interruption to lateral passage along the shore. And those are all things that necessarily don't get permitted through the conservation commission process but they get permitted through chapter 91 to maintain that access and maintain people's ability to get from, you know, point A to point B uh, without interruption or out having to get their feet too wet without, you know, tidal cycling or, or, or have to go out of their way or, or trespass on private property to maintain their, their walking corridor along the shore. And chapter 91 is really, you know, kind of the, the major protection to that. So anytime you're designing a permit that's gonna require chapter 91 licensure, uh, we always encourage people at the local conservation commission level to try to incorporate some level of public access right up front and have that discussion all the way through all of the permitting process, because that way, if you're going to end up with stairs over a dock or a path that you need to maintain that's there, you can include that in your conservation commission permit and not have to come back and amend or do. So sometimes reaching out in advance is a really great tool or having conversations with our staff here is, is something that can be helpful for people as well. And really the best tool that we have is a municipality and our little plug. I wish I could see Steve McKenna right now on, on my screen because I'm sure he's happy to see this is our Nantucket and Manic and Harbors Action Plan. And really this plan probably doesn't get as much as press as it should, 
It was last updated in 2009 and we're, we're currently under an extension from, uh, from coastal zone management for our plan that is normally a 10 year plan. Uh, we had some kind of delays related to COVID and some funding delays to, to update it and bring it up to date. But what this plan does is it's a publicly fueled plan. It's developed through a committee of people that's made up of, of town officials and citizens and other user groups to kind of signify what we expect the uses around our harbors to be. And this is what, you know, the town would like to see happen around our harbors, whether it's a moratorium on docks and piers, which then became, you know, codified in zoning that came out of that, or how we want to access the water sheet that runs through. But what this plan does is once it's adopted by the state, it's also something that when people are reviewing chapter 91 applications or coastal zone management is reviewing, you know, something that comes to them, they can look at what the town has identified and what the citizens have identified as goals and objectives for the harbor plan. And as they're also trying to aid in what that public benefit can be, can use that harbor plan to help make their decision and, and help make what that benefit would be and be in congruence with the harbor plan. And so they know that the public benefit is something that the town also is, is seeking to have and look to do. So this is really something that I, I'll definitely encourage everyone as we're coming into our update process to please be involved, provide your input, let us know what you want to see around the harbor. Because keeping in mind that if you don't tell us when someone comes in for, for a private use on private property and needs to get a chapter 91 license, you know, determining what that public benefit is may be more of a process or may not always be something that we think that fits with what we want. So this plan is critical to do that. So uh, again, we're going to be starting on that process soon. So you know, check back in. We're happy to provide that. Uh, but that's really in a nutshell how, how Chapter 91 works here locally. Um, I'll leave it rest to the experts to, to really get into the nuts and bolts. But I think uh, at this point, I think we'd be happy to take any questions um, for the opening part of the presentation. Jeff, thank you. And your invitation for questions is very apt and appropriate. Um, if participants have a question, they would raise their hand. And I just lost my screen. There we go. Sorry, it just keeps bouncing around. The, I can see the hands of Bruce has a question. Bruce, fire away. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what point in the presentation to ask my two questions, but I'll try now. I have two questions. Uh, both pertain to Madigan. And I believe it's pertinent to what we're discussing today. One question revolves around the use of the F Street dock, and the other revolves around some uh, discussion and problems we're having in a certain area along the harbor where a property owner has uh, strung up some uh, small barricades and is not allowing people to walk across the beach. And uh, I'm not sure that it's clear to us, let's talk about the beach issue first, where, where we can actually identify the mean high tide line because this property owner is very active in terms of uh, approaching people who are walking along the shore with their children or uh, just taking a stroll and telling them they can't cross the property. They have to go out in the water to walk around. And it's been a little bit controversial, but we can't seem to find a clarification about that. And my other question is at the F Street dock where uh, there's a commercial boating activity that goes on there and they refuel their boats there and whatnot. And at times when we want to use part of the dock for our leisure boat to pick up some people or whatnot, the slots along the boat pier are blocked by this commercial boat. 
uh, activity and they have three, four, sometimes four plus a little fly fishing boat. And they're there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes refueling, taking on passengers, things of that nature. And they deny us the use of that dock or if our boat is there uh, to pick someone up or, or, or drop someone off, they insist that we immediately leave so they have access to it. And I'm wondering how this falls in with chapter 91 and perhaps uh, some of the people on the call could discuss both of those issues, please. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Jeff, if you've got a couple of quick answers, go ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to suggest that you and Bruce uh, go into uh, individual conversation because we are aware those those are very complex questions, and uh, we've only allotted ten minutes for Q and A. Uh, Jeff, your 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 turn. Sure. So I'll go quickly. I I think the question about the beach is probably better answered probably by by uh, Mr. Fergata um, as he gets into the particulars of Chapter ninety one. So that may be a good question for later. Um, but I'd be happy to talk to to Bruce about that kind of offline as well. As it relates to, to the peer and the use of the peer, um, you know, chapter 91 obviously plays a component into that for access, but sometimes the use of their, if there's concerns, I would definitely suggest probably speaking to the Harbor Master about what that would be. But again, I'm happy to, to help connect Bruce with, with those resources. So just to clarify, Jeff, for all the attendees, um, the peer is listed on the sign on F Street as a publicly owned facility. Is that correct? Correct. The F Street Pier is, is owned and operated by the, the town of Nantucket. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Leslie Forbes. Leslie, hi. Hi. Um, Jeff, I just wondered, I, thank you for the introduction to how 91 works on Nantucket. What is the enforcement mechanism on Nantucket? Sure, so I'll try to answer, and, and if any of the other panelists want to correct me, uh, if I misspeak, uh, they can feel free. So on Nantucket, it's important to keep in mind that the Waterways Act is, is a state act, and it's not something that we have necessarily put in locally. It doesn't function the same as Wetlands Protection Act, where they've designated a lot of responsibility of that through a local conservation commission. So most of the ending enforcement authority is with, is with the folks at Mass Waterways through DEP. Um, and they, they take care of that. Obviously, we occasionally provide some eyes and ears on the ground if there's a complaint that's filed that, you know, we can go out and take pictures and provide them information and are happy to do so. Uh, but any enforcement action that would come would come from the state level. Jeff, you, uh, you tickle a question in my mind, so I'm going to take moderator's prerogative, lay this question out and not expect an answer until of the end of the um, formal presentations, at which point we have another question and answer period. And the question's a simple one. Uh, the answer is not. Is there any likelihood that Nantucket could have delegation of authority for chapter 91 so that we don't have to be crossing our 25 miles of water every time we need, we need the state? Um, unless you've got a quick answer like no or yes, um, let's let's just tuck that one away for the second Q&A period. Well, the, I think my quick answer to that is that it, that is a decision that is well above my pay grade. <laughs> okay, uh, but but we we would have to ask somebody somewhere somehow. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that because I think it's time to move on uh, to our next presenter. And folks, if you could see me below the camera you would find me shuffling my papers because I want to introduce Carlos Fregata uh, appropriately. Um, Carlos, you're going to be next. Carlos Fregata is an environmental analyst in the Department of Environmental Protection's Waterways Program, which is under the Division of Wetlands and Water Waterways. He holds a BS degree with a double major in Marine and General Biology from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Carlos, you can tell us when uh, when it's your turn. Were you able to do that in four years or did the double major uh, add some time? 
His current duties include reviewing Chapter 91 license applications and making recommendations for approvals, which are signed by the governor. And uh, obviously that makes my previous question a little complicated. Carlos, please. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending and, think, and taking interest in your waterways. <clears throat> and I just wanted to say, I was taking notes as some of the other speakers were doing their presentations. And my presentation is gonna have an overview of chapter 91. And I would just counter to say, it's worth repeating. I think it takes sometimes three, I've got some repetitive slides. And Frank, Share Carlos is freezing up a little bit. Uh, okay, Carlos. Um, it might just be a, a temporary dip in your internet connectivity. Uh, please continue, and if it becomes a problem, then we'll address it. Fair enough. Do I sound better now? Yes. Oh, good. Maybe I'm talking too fast. And, and as I asked Jeff, uh, go to full, go to slideshow on your uh, shared screen. That's excellent. Thank you, Carlos. Great. I just want to tell you folks about this photo. I was doing a whale watch excursion. Nice rainbows formed by the whale. And it reminds me of chapter 91. It's so old that potentially where I came off to do this with the skipper of that boat could have been the same site where whales actually went out to catch whales, to kill them, bring them back. I do want to give you that overview, like I was saying, the history and purpose. So it's going to be repetitive, but it is really worth listening to. And I've got a lot more graphic representations of Chapter 91. So hopefully it'll get everyone in the audience, because I'm a graphic thinker myself. We're we'll talking about the geographic jurisdiction, how we look at uses, not just structures, and the actual structures and even uses that are subject to jurisdiction. And then I was asked to provide some answers to or just to bring to light three of the processes through chapter 91. One is public comment. So I'll talk a little bit about public comment and town involvement as well. And then public access. Chapter 91, as you've heard before, is rooted in the public trust doctrine, which I think amazing that years ago, some could have said, we all have a right to the sea and with it the shore. It's all our property. I jumped ahead. In prior to everything being formalized, in the 1630s, the Massachusetts colonial government gave away, and we've heard this before, gave away the intertidal area. That's the area between mean high water and mean low water. That's not exactly high tide and low tide, but it's close. It's based on different averages of water levels. But if you can imagine, they were trying to encourage people to build boats and go out and increase commerce. So they gave away the land, but they had the foresight to say, we're not gonna give away the water. So that's where that easement comes into play. It allows you to walk from point A to point B across the property. Not to gawk at people, <laughs> but literally to walk across the property. And they expect that people doing that aren't just walking around, they're potentially fishing, fowling, or navigating or the natural deriv derivatives there too. So it could be, you could argue that it, it would be with a set of binoculars you are waterfowling, but that's something that the courts can decide. Through chapter 91, we definitely solidify that in case there's any question. And then in 1641 to 1647, as was stated before, the colonial ordinances were codifying the public trust, trust doctrine and then from the 1700s until 1866, it became more formalized, but it's still not there. Anytime someone wanted to build a structure or bring some fill in, they would file a bill that would become a law. Some people might know that as the warfaring statutes. And then finally in 1866, chapter 91 became enacted and it was also called the Public Waterfront Act. And again, it is 
the first and oldest waterways licensing program in the country. So it became formalized. But what's funny is I looked at one of the plans that was shown by Jeff Carlson and it has a date on it. It says 19, actually 2009 for the 12488 license. And then it has a tiny little notation that says license 9141, but with no date. If I were to search, I would find there could be two or three licenses with license number 9141. And that's because chapter 91 is so old, it was passed on from agency to agency and they renumbered from one to whatever. So the 2000s where you see a lot of triplicate licenses, just keep that in mind. If you're doing research, make sure you ask for the date. Also, if you go to the state acts and resolves section of the state house, you'll find these grants that were given from 1700s on up till now. It can be done now like anything else. You can change the law anytime you want. But generally speaking, the 1866, the present day situation is what we have been using for all that time with a license, et cetera. Another principle of the public trust doctrine as you can read here is an edict from the Roman times and in old English law. And I call it my mission statement. The state as trustee of the public's rights has a, has a right to, um, the, preserve natural resources, example, the air, sea, and the shore, and the public's rights to appreciate them, to enjoy them. Chapter 91, the law has been fleshed out with the regulations at 310 CMR 9, separate from the Wellness Protection Act regulations from 1972. It again, codifies the public trust doctrine and the, the the, uh, colonial ordinances of the 1600s. So this gave a, a nice procedural roadmap on how to get your license issued. And again, these keywords, proper public purpose, that's very important, especially when it comes to non, especially when it comes to fill tide lands and then non-water dependent projects, which we'll get into. Chapter 91 regulations also protect and promote water dependent uses. So we do wanna see a priority of uses out on the waterfront. We wanna see water dependent uses. And we'll get into that a little later. We protect the public health, safety and general welfare with the regulations. Think of it as the natural environment, for example, shellfish. You wanna make sure the docks don't have floats that are hitting on the shellfish uh, habitat. Navigational hazards is really more about making sure people can get to and from their property and not be blocked if they have a boat, for example, or even a dock that's close by. The hob master would deal with safety issues of speeding and people swimming around another area where there might be another dock close by or a marina. And storm damage would be, we wanna make sure structures are built properly. And that's why we recommend engineered designs so that they don't break up in a storm. And of course, famously, public access to it along the shoreline for the public's enjoyment. There are four main areas of jurisdiction, which we've already talked about. I'll try to go through them quickly. And I do have some pictorial examples as well. Flow tide lands, fill tide lands. An example here is the lighthouse. You can see the dark band. That dark band on that riprap represents the high and low water. Not the high tide necessarily, but it could be. So these lines could be coincident, but they're not necessarily coincident. And the Army Corps uses high tide, chapter 91 uses mean high water, as does the Wetlands Act. So these are areas that is general areas until someone goes out and actually investigates on the site and all looks at data. Here's a photo of filled tide lands with a boat ramp and a dock. So there are filled uh, flowed tide lands shown there in use. The blue lines represent the historic line where the water used to be. It's a snapshot in time, it's not a, a mean or an average. That is Fairhaven. Peace Park is the area up top above the blue line. Between the two blue lines is filled. It was a car dealership, which is now vacant. It was going to be one of my projects where they were uh, excuse me, proposing a residential facility, condominiums. And I was ready to come up with some amenities that would bring back the public access along there, which would tie into the Fairhaven's Miss Bahaba plan, which is also Fairhaven slash New Bedford's Miss Bahaba plan, just by coincidence, they decided to work together. The area here used to be, the, the yellow line depicts the historic 
low water. Now there's a new low water right along the street. So boats were floated in, or maybe people built boats and floated them out from inside. It's now Cushman Park to the right where you can't see it, to the east. Then there are great ponds and non-navigable, I'm sorry, non-titled navigable rivers and streams. Those are the freshwater streams. The jurisdictional boundaries of flow Thailands are mean high water, fill Thailands would be the historic high water, which I've already mentioned, both of those. Landlocked is something that Nantucket, I believe, has. If you're in an area where there are filled tidelands, if there's 200 feet of filled tidelands with a public way, the, there's a cutoff because large expanses of filled tidelands would mean everyone has to file. And this is one of those political compromises. Great ponds, any pond in 10 acres in its natural state. If you dam it, it gets larger. High watermark is the jurisdictional boundary. And we did speak about the great ponds being on a list, or maybe you didn't mention list, but we have a great ponds list. Here's the website to it. There are seven ponds listed for Nantucket. I'll go over them again. Cuscata, Gibbs, Hummock, Long, Mia Comet, Sasa Chacha, and Tom Nevers ponds. If there's a pond out there that is 10 acres in its natural state, it can still be a great pond, but it's just not on the list. That means we're not prioritizing it. That's all it means. Non-navigable -nav rivers and streams can be navigated almost all the time, as you can see by this sentence here. And I have a kayak, and I know I can get through culverts even. High watermark is the, the line that we use for jurisdiction. And keep in mind that if you did have a river, the center line would be the property line and all that would be, would be private, but we would still have an access easement or some other type of easement. Pictorially, flow tide lands again, filled, great ponds and non tidal rivers and streams. So now you have a picture in your mind instead of all these words, boats on floats, financial buildings on filled tide lands, piers on great ponds and paddling on navigable rivers. Chapter 91 is very unique to some of the laws because it does look at uses. Water dependent uses such as this Boston, Long Wharf in Boston, which has navigation and transportation. As you can see, there's a ferry service there. Commercial fishing, that's a use. Residential. This public park in Beverly is on filled Thailands, but it's still a water dependent use because it requires direct access to the water. Doesn't matter if it's filled or not filled. But we will push hard against any project that's not water dependent over the water. That's the one categorical restriction. Non water dependent uses pictorially Rose Wharf in Boston. There might be a, a hotel with a restaurant and office space. Down on the bottom right is the Newbury Port retail shops area where there might be a restaurant. It's on Phil Thailand's. This is a restaurant. That's the Atlantic in Egertown. It's one of my projects. To the right is the Habermaster area where they have whatever they have. I'm not sure it's sailing classes and they, or they just lease out the area, but you can see the dinghy docks there. To the left is a, a private property with a, I believe it's a hotel. This is a house that could have been a boathouse that changed its use. We have ways of working things out. And I don't want to use the word variance, but I'll say variance. Variance is very difficult to get through chapter 91. It's not like a variance through the Board of Appeals. Just keep that in mind. And that's the one thing we don't allow. If someone would propose a new one, we would say, show us how that meets the regulations because we don't see it. You require direct access to the water if you're you do not require direct access to the water if you're a non-water dependent project. If you have a dock and you start having weddings on it, it becomes a non-water dependent use. Keep that in mind, just so you understand the difference. So it is, it is difficult sometimes. Some of the activities requiring review, and there's so many of them. Remember, IOU, in, on, over, or under the water of all the geographic areas I just explained. There are exceptions. I'm not gonna get into those exceptions because 
lawyers wrote them and they can be read differently. If I read something three months from now, I, I literally might read it differently. And I'll have to you know, think about what the case history is on, on, on that. There are, there are authorizations will either be a license or a permit. And you can see the citation there. This is a residential dock. You can see that there's no sign, but there should be a sign there. It could be one that's on the property line. We give that option. The stairs are supposed to be at mean high water, not necessarily in the water, out of the water, but right down the middle. Makes no sense to me. I think everybody should just put it up on the upgrading side on the right. This list is incredible. Construction, maintenance, reconstruction of unauthorized fill of structures, existing or proposed structures of fill, existing or proposed uses, change in use of structural alteration. That's a lot of things. So a lot of things come before chapter 91. You can always call the office and I can give you advice. And Jeff, I was gonna say, I'm gonna make a joke about how you've done so well that uh, it felt like an interview and you're hired. You did a great job. We need more people like you understanding the chapter 91 regulations. And the other authorization will be a permit. We use permits for dredging, beach nourishment, lowering of water levels and temporary structures. I have a temporary structure right now in a Superfund site in New Bedford, she, uh, sheet pilings going in and coffer dams it's temporary, so they're doing a permit, so they don't have to go to the governor. That's one, one good thing about the temporary structures. Other than that, they would need a license, which would be several months. You have to have mile hours, have an engineer. Well, they all have engineers, but you know, we'd have to go to the governor. So, the, so it's better to talk to, the, to me or someone else on the staff at, at DEP, and we have a Boston office as well. And they, Boston deals with non-water dependent projects, FYI. Remember the IOU? Now, how do you know when an application has been filed? The Chapter 91 application requires public notice as does under the Wetlands Act. This is an example of a public notice. This is through an, this is through an 01 application, which is a regular slash standard license, but there, are, there is an avenue for homeowners to do a license where they do their own based upon template language. But in this case, they had to come to me first through an application, I reviewed it and I gave them a letter with technical administrative and administrative deficiencies along with the public notice to be published in the paper of local circulation, which is normally the Conservation Commission's favorite paper because most the commission will know what gets the most distribution. There's a comment period, 30 days for a license, 15 days for a, for a permit. Comments will come to me for an 01. Unless of course it's not one dependent, it'll be someone in Boston. However, there is a new uh, way to file. There's a regular slash standard license in 01. There's a simplified license in 06. Then I think it's 24. That's the general license certification. That has been designed to require people to send comments to the planning board. So the planning board has to look at the project and see if it causes a heartache. If it doesn't meet with the regulations, they would then send a comment to DEP in Boston. And then they, they could then decide if it should be if the project should get a certification. Now these are details that you don't need to know right now, but just keep in mind there are different ways, but this is the one way where you see a larger project come before the come before the town. So the public gets to see this, the town board's gonna to see this if they look in the paper. And here's what it looks like, obviously in the paper you've seen these. It does have some language saying if you don't appeal, or if you don't comment within 10 days, sorry, 30, sorry, if you don't comment within 30 days, I'm getting ahead of myself, then you lose your right to appeal. It's not a planning, it's not a Board of Appeals appeal. This is one that goes directly to adjudicatory. If you file with conservation and you appeal that, it goes to the order with the state, but it doesn't go to adjudicatory until you appeal that. In this case, state issued permit directly, it's not deferred to the local authority. So if you comment, you then have standing and we'll give you a draft license, which you can then appeal to adjudicatory. It's an administrative hearing. That's called the tear sheet. Now, how else would the municipality know? With the 01 license, the regular slash standard license, that's for larger projects over 600 square feet, for example, and for non-water dependent projects, you would have the zoning agent would hopefully sign this form to say that you can see where it says to be completed by municipal clerk or appropriate municipal official. I hereby certify that the project described above and more fully detailed in the applicant's waterways license application and plans is not in violation 
local zoning ordinances and bylaws. If this isn't signed, I'm probably not gonna act on it. So the, this is an important form. The other form that is part of the application, so there's 13 pages there, is this form here. It's a municipal planning board notification. It's a certification that the planning board receives it, but not a certification that it complies with the municipal laws. So it's important to keep that in mind. Determine who should be the one fielding these. So don't just have someone else grab it and give it to you later, a week later. The planning board has special powers in the regulations that allow them to almost dovetail the process on the chapter 91, which is very unique to a lot of laws. Another way is to get notified is this way. Once I get the application, I will send out that public notice like I mentioned before. Along with it, I'll ask the proponent to send out an eight and a half by 11 copy of the plans, not the application, it's the plans. The plans should speak to the application anyway and should speak to the narrative. It should be very clear on those plans along with a copy of the public notice that you saw. It, doesn't, it won't be the newspaper notification, it'll be that piece of paper I, you saw that shows the, the public notice before it's put in the paper. And you can see a Selectman board, Planning Board Conservation Harbor Master and Land Notice Easement Holders and now a Butters. This is my project, the Atlantic Restaurant in Eggertown. About it to the left would be the hotel, to the right would be the Harbor Master. The other agencies on the right are shown here. Coastal Zone Management, the Massachusetts Vineyard Commission. I think Nantucket's pretty much up to speed on notifying people. They have their own commission, I'm told. And then you've got the other agencies you can see there. And then I was asked to talk a little bit about public access. We can talk about it more, but I just want to, and this is already a reiteration of what, what's been shown. In this case, you can see it says license available inside. This is for a large structure, non-water dependent or possibly a water dependent project like a marina where you'd want people to, to go inside to see the full document because it's probably pretty complicated for probably explaining what the rights are that the public has, including restrooms. In this case, it's a dock. The signage is very small. It's shown right at mean high water. The stairs go up and over. People can't picnic or use that dock for fishing, it's private, but because it's a private structure, the applicant will now give back some rights, which definitely would be public access along the shoreline. Sometimes there are more rights depending on the magnitude of the project. That's what the sign looks like. It has the convenient icons, fishing, following, navigation, and strolling, which solidify the chapter 91 regulations and, and the statute and the public dust doc trust doctrine. I also do research, as was, men was mentioned earlier by Jeff. The Egger town of Eggertown has a municipal harbor plan. They have other, and they, I, I think I grabbed both of these from the municipal harbor plan, but I'm not positive. That could have been a different study, but it could have been incorporated by reference. This is a, a license plan from 1900s. And here's the restaurant, the Atlantic restaurant. And I noted that here on this slide that the public access path that Megatown wants to see, and they want to see a similar treatment. There are many different ways to do it. You can put that plaque, the granite slab in there, you know, that, that cube with a little arrow, or you can have brick treatment as Egerton does, which is the same kind of brick throughout. And it literally will, ch literally will change as the road changes. It could be pavement that's black, and then you get this brick pavement that's red. And, you, and people will see that easily, re recognizing that it's a public access path. Boston has the, the, oh, gee, I can't remember the trail now. Anyway, it's, it's the, blue, the blue path. Uh, it's, I think it's a blue line. The Harbor Walk, thank you. Memory, thank you. The only restaurant's right there. So right away, I could see that I need to do something with this project. I needed to incorporate Martha's Vineyard, um, Eggertown's Mississippi Harbor Plan. And Eggertown, by the way, with the Mississippi Harbor Plan, expands on the public access path. They can ask for whatever they want. I think they asked for 10 feet here, but they could ask for 20. So they actually expand, amplify the regulations, which is really unique. I mean, who does that? The state's actually working with a town hand in hand to say, nope, the state says the, the town of Eggertown wants a wider path, we're gonna do it. So that's very, that was very fascinating to me to see this. I'm more of a wetlands person, but when it came to chapter 91, this, this is what keeps me interested. It's a very interesting law. 
And I've drawn, I've shown here the two lines, historic high and historic low. So I, I verified this through GIS and I can see that that's roughly where the historic jurisdiction is where they brought fill in. That's the restaurant again. And here's the restaurant. Before it's a restaurant, they filled in this whole area and the restaurant was then put in place. This is the outcome. The town of Eggertown wanted the pedestrian walkway. I drew it in here, but you can see the brick pavement on there. You can also see a dot, it's a multi-use situation where you have a restaurant with people sitting out looking at the water. Price of the meal goes up, obviously. The patrons love that, but then they also have to compromise a little bit and let the people walk on this easement that they already have. It might be, not be the same area, but it certainly is an easement that's brought back to life. And they had their boats in there. And the harbor master has control of the other boats that go further to the south, or down at the bottom of the page. Again, that's the restaurant. And we're looking head on at that dock that goes down to the restaurant. It's not shown on the plan, but it is shown here this, uh, in the forefront. I grabbed this plan in case someone else didn't. I didn't have my GIS, my arc map working, but I went on Olivo, which is a free service through MassGIS, and I created this plan. The yellow line is a consistent line. It can be any color you want, but Oliver uses yellow. So just for convention's sake, keep it yellow. So it shows that fill would be on the right side or to the east. The blue line is the public way. This is a zoom in to show you everything without the author photo, it's less cluttered now and it's less complicated. You can actually see the, the buildings. I, I had the building roofs show up, the building footprint. New Wales Street connects with Commercial Street. So that's something that's in Nantucket that you'd wanna keep active in any of your plans, obviously. And I, I'm, I think, I haven't seen it. it. You don't have a municipal harbor plan to my knowledge, but you have some kind of plan. We can talk about that later, of course. So to reiterate, I gave you a quick overview, talked about geographic jurisdiction, use determinations, activities that could trigger jurisdiction, talked quickly, very quickly about public comment, town involvement and public access. And here's my contact information. So I'll leave it up to the moderator. Carlos, thank you. Uh we're going to hold that slide so that people have time to write it down, carlos.fragata at mass.gov. Now, you did uh, say that there would be questions. If people would raise their hand, we'll call on them after the last speaker. Carlos, thank you. We're going to move to our next speaker, who is Stephen McKenna with the Coastal Zone Management uh, Division of also the Department of Environmental Resources. I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction and then I'm going to uh, take moderator's privilege. Stephen McKenna began his career over 20 years ago, working first with the Buzzards Bay Project National Estuary Program and then with the Mass Department of Environmental Protection and uh, then became part of the Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management Team where he is currently the Cape and Islands Regional Coordinator. He works on a wide range of coastal issues, including many things that are familiar to us on Nantucket, coastal resilience, coastal erosion, shoreline management, port and harbor planning, dredging, and stormwater management. Stephen is a graduate of Massachusetts Maritime Academy and a native of Cape Cod. So Stephen, if you'll just permit me a moment, I did a legislative history on some of our environmental acts and a substantial number of laws, clean air, clean water, were revised into their current form during the term of President Richard Nixon. One act that did not pass, but uh, got a lot of uh, notoriety was a public land use planning act that would have re uh, required the states to zone their entire state, uh, much as municipalities do it now. A member of the President's Council on Environmental Quality once told me, never has an act that did not pass have so much environmental influence. 
because the uh, Land Use Planning Act had a section on areas of critical environmental concern, one of which is the coast. They are fragile or historic lands, renewable resource lands, such as prime farmland, and natural hazard lands. Out of that, areas of critical environmental concern upon which or, or for which development is deemed to be unsuitable is the coastal zone. And that is the legislative history of the Coastal Zone Management Act, uh, which along with clean air, clean water and a bunch of others uh, was passed during uh, the time of President Nixon. Steve, I hope yet I will cede you back the uh, minute and a half that I took. Steve, you're on. Well, well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, workshop. It, it's uh, great to see community focus on Chapter 91. In the 20 years that I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever participated in a local workshop focused specifically on Chapter 91. So I, th I think that's fantastic. Um, as you mentioned, I work for Coastal Zone Management um, as a regional coordinator, and I've had the opportunity to work with Town of Nantucket over the last 20 years on a lot of different issues, stormwater, uh, coastal erosion, port and harbor planning, and now certainly coastal resilience. But uh, what I wanted to talk about today is um, uh, municipal harbor plans and how they relate to um, Chapter 91, the focus of today's discussion. So I've got a presentation. I'm gonna try to bring it up here um, if you folks bear with me, I'll try to do this. Okay. Can everyone see that all right? Yes, although you may want to go to your first slide. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, so um, in this discussion of chapter 91, I, I wanted to relate it to municipal harbor plans uh, for the obvious reason that, as Jeff mentioned, Town of Nantucket has a state approved municipal harbor plan. So let me jump right in. Uh, what are municipal harbor plans? I'll start from that and then I'll kind of zero down to, um, to Nantucket's municipal harbor plan. But in general, these plans are developed that they um, serve a purpose to um, help implement um, and promote a community's planning vision for their waterfront area. Um, and also, in addition to that, they help inform and guide state agency decisions. And when they say that, in most cases, this applies to Chapter 91 licensing decisions. However, it can't, they can be used to guide other um, state agency decisions around it in a particular harbor planning area. The Municipal Harbor Planning Regulations, uh, 301 CMR 23 for you lawyers in the crowd. Um, these are administered by CZM and they establish a voluntary process by which a community can set about um, going through the process of obtaining a state approved harbor plan. Um, this happens, the community approaches the state, they tell they're interested in um, going through this process. The uh, Harbor planning regulations uh, lay out a very prescriptive uh, planning process, which the town will then embark upon um, with the final outcome being the development of a draft municipal harbor plan, in which case they will submit it to the state through CZM uh, for review and approval. Um, that includes uh, public hearing, uh, public comment period, so the uh, public can weigh in and ultimately with the approval and adoption of this state approved municipal harbor plan. So how do these municipal harbor plans relate to chapter 91? And I should preface this with saying, when I say municipal harbor plan, I'm referring to state approved municipal harbor plans. Many communities have local harbor plans, which are great, but they're a different animal in their context of chapter 91 licensing than a state approved uh, municipal harbor plan. So, um, in the generalist terms, the uh, municipal harbor plan gives the communities an opportunity to integrate their local planning goals into state chapter 90 licensing decisions within the harbor planning area. Um, it also really focuses on that part of the harbor planning area that is within chapter 91 jurisdiction, and it establishes the communities, you know, their objectives, their standards, and their policies for projects within that um, 
the water and the land in that chapter 91 jurisdiction. Because of that, um, state approved municipal harbor plans must be uh, found to be consistent with state guidelines and objectives and associated regulatory principles of chapter 91. And that's a formal part of the approval process. Um, DEP reviews the plan as well and basis, basically blesses it and confers that it is in fact consistent with their policies and regulation. So how does it do this? How does a municipal harbor plan provide guidance, specific guidance to chap the chapter 91 licensing process? Well, there's two provisions in the regulations um, that allow them to do this. Um, the first is called amplifications and the second substitutions. Amplifications, these are specific modifications to certain discretionary requirements of the chapter 91 waterways regulations. And what that means is there are certain regulations that have a certain amount of discretion with, with them. In a uh, municipal harbor plan, they can speak specifically to a parcel or an issue and provide guidance um, relative to that regulation uh, that DP can then use in its, its discretionary way to implement the community's wishes in that language or that license. The second is substitution, and these are specific substitutions for uh, minimum use limitations or numerical standards outlined in the regulations. Um, these are generally parcel specific and frequently relate to non-water dependent properties, but they can relate um, to water dependent as well. Um, and they are, a, a they are done in conjunction with what's called an offset um, in the idea of an offset is to ensure that these minimum use limitations or numerical standards are met, but it allows flexibility on how they're met. So a simple um, example might be, we talked about the theater project in Nantucket and um, they were required to have certain requirements for the general public because they exist on full timers. And probably a certain amount of space was required, was required in um, numerical standards and used as uh, restrooms in this facility. Well, hypothetically, a community could ask for a substitution for that requirement. Envision the case where there's a parcel being developed, but the on that particular parcel, uh, that public use, that restroom, it's just not a good site for that. However, there's another site being developed just down the way where it has better foot traffic or better access to the water is a better place for that uh, public accommodation. So they could request that that use be um, substituted and done on a different parcel. And um, however, to those same standards so that those standards are met, but just in a different form. This builds in flexibility um, for communities in their harbor planning area and these are very, these are looked at very carefully. DEP um, participates in the review of these substitution provisions, again, to ensure that the minimums are met, the intent of the regulation is met, but uh, building in flexibility. So in effect, uh, this allows DEP to waive these specific use limitations and numeric standards um, in favor of the modified provisions um, identified in the approved municipal harbor plan. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about Nantucket's um, uh, municipal harbor plan. And when I say municipal harbor plan, again, this is the term in the regulations, most of them have a title. Uh, Nantucket's, it's called the Nantucket and Mattacan Harbors Action Plan, but we think about it as a municipal harbor plan. So um, for background, the plan builds upon the first um, Harbors Action Plan, which was prepared in 1993 and then was finally approved by the state in 2009 um, for a period of 10 years. Uh, municipal Harbor Plans, they're, they're approved for a certain period of time, usually anywhere between five and 10 years. So that plan, the first plan was approved in 2009 and expired in 2019. As Jeff mentioned, the towns um, sought a couple of extensions as allowing them time to work on a plan renewal. Um, the plan focuses on three main areas. Um, first, the improvement of public access. Uh, the second is maintaining and improving water dependent uses within the harbor. And the third is the protection of natural resource areas and water quality as it relates to commercial and recreational shellfishing. 
embedded within the plan, it contains clear guidance to DEP to help them with licensing decisions within the harbor planning area. So how does it do that? Well, it does it with three specific amplifications, which I just talked about. And these relate to um, a harbor planning, uh, harbor overlay district, uh, a private dock and pier prohibition, and the identification of water dependent uses that are not consistent with the plan in which the community does not want in this harbor planning area. So I'm gonna jump into these a little bit, talk about each one of these ampl amplifications briefly. Um, the first one and the most comprehensive, the Harbor Overlay District. And this was a zoning district and associated zoning bylaws. It was adopted in 2008. And it was created to ensure and protect that existing water dependent uses around the harbor were protected. And more importantly, that these water dependent uses weren't um, pushed out by non-water dependent uses over time. Um, in addition to um, helping protect these water dependent uses, it um, identified water dependent uses, um, commercial uses that are allowed in the harbor area. So by doing that, by identifying water dependent uses that are um, allowed within the harbor planning area, kind of by default, it also identified uses that they found non-consistent with the harbor areas. And these were identified again in the plan as a specific um, item. And these um, were developed to protect the island's traditional water dependent uses, as well as the kind of the community's character. So these uh, uses, which are not consistent, are cruise ship terminals and support services, personal watercraft rental, think jet skis, and um, new facilities of private tenancies, uh, fancy way of saying private, um, private dwellings. So the last amplification, the third one, is um, a strong one, and it relates to the private um, Dr. Pierre prohibition. So within the Nantucket um, zoning bylaw, as part of the Harbor Overlay District, um, it established a prohibition on all new private docks and piers, that it allowed the exception for um, certain public docks, um, such as town pier, um, things like that, as well as um, any commercial um, dock and piers related to commercial activity. Um, the prohibition was set up to, um, and the rationale for it was to protect and enhance the ability of the public to access traditional shell fishing areas, um, to protect uh, lateral navigation along the shoreline, and protect water quality and natural resources, and again, to preserve the uh, traditional community character. So those are the three very specific um, ways that um, the plan provides guidance to DEP, Chapter 90 licensing decisions, um, in the context of these three amplifications. So that's the existing plan right now. And as Jeff mentioned, you folks are hopefully looking at um, a renewal, um, whether that's this year or next year, you know, that remains to be determined. But when I think about that, I. I think that's a very good process for a community to go through um, because um, if it's um, every 10 years or a little bit longer in this case, the process of looking back, seeing what's in the existing plan um, and also thinking about any new or emerging issues, they may be very different than what they were 10 plus years ago. So it allows the community to give that some thought to modify the plan as needed. Um, and it really allows the, the community to influence um, future development on properties within chapter 91 jurisdiction. And I think equally as important is redevelopment of some of those properties that we see within uh, chapter 91 jurisdiction. So that's, that's my overview. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for the opportunity. Steve, I appreciate it. And those who uh, have questions, um, raise your hand. We'll call on you in the question and answer period. Uh, I've noted we already have one question, uh, but we're now uh, ready for our next speaker, who's uh, Hillary Rayport. And uh, Hillary, I have your bio just here. Hillary Hedges Rayport is chair of the Nantucket Historical Commission, Nantucket's municipal commission responsible for surveying, documenting, and protecting the historic resources of Nantucket Island. Under her leadership, the newly reconstituted uh, Historic Commission 
has advocated successfully for preservation on Nantucket. Prior to her activities in preservation, Ms. Rayport had a 20 year career in venture capital investing, venture capital investing, entrepreneurial management and investment consulting. She holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and is currently a candidate for a master's in preservation studies at Boston University. Hillary, it's your turn. Fred, is she there? I'm right here. Can you hear me okay? We can and we can see okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with um, Carlos and to meet Stephen as well. Um, I found myself uh, focusing in on um, things I'd never heard of, such as the Municipal Harbor Plan and um, Chapter 91, um, because the Nantucket Historical Commission, uh, along with the town at the town's um, uh, in partnership with the town, we reviewed um, some of the potential development uh, for the Wilkes Square Harbor Place uh, parcel and um, reading and learning about how much chapter 91 affects that area. Um, I reached out to Carlos um, who, and got some great advice from Carlos uh, and incorporated that ad advice in our report and recommendations to the town, which is published on our town website. Um, so it's terrific to be here talking about uh, the, the future and the municipal harbor plan. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about the historical commission. Uh, the, the Nantucket Historical Commission, I just wanna make sure everybody understands that we are a municipal commission. Uh, we are um, part of the preservation planning function of the government along with the Historic District Commission. So the Historic District Commission is responsible for maintaining the design guidelines um, and for design review on Nantucket, uh, architectural review, permitting, issuing uh, certificates of appropriateness. Um, and the Historical Commission is a planning function. So we have no regulatory authority. Um, we're, we are an independent commission. We're authorized by the voters of Nantucket. Um, so we're accountable to the voters of Nantucket. We are appointed by the select board and we're all volunteers. There are 10 commissioners. Um, and uh, so you please think of us as the municipal body that is the voice of preservation um, in the government. Um, like the HDC, we're part of the planning and land use function um, on Nantucket. Uh, this used to um, be a more difficult task than it is now because uh, shortly after we were formed, the town created the position of a preservation planner. So we're really pleased to be able to work with Holly Bacchus, who is our uh, Nantucket town preservation planner. Um, she's the first preservation planner on Nantucket, which is pretty amazing given the history of preservation on Nantucket. Um, but she is our staff liaison. Uh, she's also the staff liaison for the HDC. Um, and she's going to be, um, Holly, I hope I'm uh, not um, taking a liberty here, but she's going to be a very important person in um, thinking about how preservation planning intersects with any development of a municipal harbor plan. Um, so I just want to also say briefly why uh, the Historical Commission is, um, is relevant to this discussion. You know, what we do, our primary function is uh, to identify, evaluate, and protect historic resources. So identifying the resources, the buildings, the structures, the monuments, the objects, uh, and the cultural landscapes on Nantucket. Um, and because Nantucket, the whole island is a National Historic Landmark, we also um, consider in our work protecting the special visual quality of the island as expressed through the physical objects um, on the island. Uh, as that is part of our, our mandate. Evaluating the resources, evaluating the character, the significance, the integrity, um, and protecting these resources by developing programs, methods, tools, and processes, processes for their continued use. Um, that's really the core of, of what historical commissions in Massachusetts do. There's uh, 300 and 
41 historical commissions in Massachusetts. Um, we all work under the Massachusetts Historical Commission, which is the state entity. And this I idea of identifying, evaluating, and protecting these resources is um, the core of preservation planning. Um, so one of the major initiatives we're kicking off this uh, coming fiscal year is an island-wide survey of historic resources. Um, the last island-wide survey was done in 1989, um, and in many ways it was experimental, um, it was not finished, and um, in many cases what was completed was somewhat cursory. So um, we have thousands of buildings uh, and other objects on Nantucket to survey and document, and we think that when we complete this task, which will take years, um, the HDC will have the information they need to do their work um, issuing certificates of appropriateness and evaluating structures um, through their architectural review. So we're, we were very pleased to get news um, just the other week that we were awarded a grant from the Massachusetts Historical Commission for survey planning. And this will assist us in, um, in kicking off this process. And we're also grateful to the planning director and the select board for supporting that grant application and providing matching funds for the grant. Um, because if, uh, you know, if the town doesn't, um, doesn't provide resources for this effort, we won't be able to do it. And so far they've been incredibly supportive. So we're grateful for that. Um, we're also concerned with the historic resources that are in public trust um, under the ownership of the town. So we advocate for the protection of resources that are in the ownership of the public through the town. Um, most recently, we've been advocating for the protection of historic curbs, cobblestones, and other street artifacts. And we're also concerned with the protection of open space, of uh, historic trees, um, and proper stewardship of monuments in town-owned buildings. So ultimately, we think Nantucket should be a leader in terms of municipal preservation programs. Um, and part of what we want to do in our advisory role as an independent commission is assist our elected leaders and department heads um, regarding preservation. Um, we have just this week uh, received some help in that initiative. Um, I'm very proud to announce just this week that uh, the Park Service has uh, recognized Nantucket as part of their certified local government program. Um, I wish this had a more exciting title. <laughs> CLG sort of sounds like something you'd attach to a carburetor. But in fact, um, it is a program that the Park Service and the state Massachusetts, Massachusetts Historical Commission reserves for the historical commissions that have demonstrated the commitment and capability to implement historic preservation planning at a professional level. Um, so Nantucket is the 27th CLG in the state, um, and it's an honor that brings along with it preferable access to grants, a closer relationship with uh, the state and federal preservation planning functions um, for technical guidance and training. Uh, and also a greater ability to independently nominate additions to the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and our preservation planner, Holly Bacchus, is our uh, certified local government coordinator. Um, and of course, our partner is the HDC um, with whom we coordinate for these activities. Um, so the Historical Commission is advocating uh, for Nantucket to always think about how its municipal plans, whether it's a housing production plan, a municipal harbor plan, or an update to the island-wide master plan, to consider how historic resources are affected in these plans. Um, and this is where the municipal harbor plan uh, comes into play. So um, as you heard from Stephen, the municipal harbor plan will help ensure that our waterfront um, areas, whether they're uh, uh, tidelands or subject to chapter 91 or just areas near the harbor, um, evolve to meet the community's objectives. Um, so those objectives include open space. Um, it includes the right to clean air and water, um, the right to have a living working harbor, uh, a clean harbor. Um, so access to the water for uh, recreation um, the Municipal Harbor Plan can address resiliency. We have a tremendous uh, resiliency study and effort going on right now through the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee and the um, Municipal Vulnerability Plan, um, which is including uh, consideration of historic resources. Um, 
The Harbor Plan will also think about uh, economic growth, which in our case on Nantucket often has to do with tourism, which is linked to clean water and public access. Um, in the case of our historic downtown, uh, the municipal Harbor Plan, um, when it's updated, what, what we at the Historical Commission will be advocating for is that historic and cultural resources are identified and protected. Um, and that the way of life on Nantucket that is so connected to the water is also protected. Um, I really appreciated that Stephen enumerated for everyone the components of the existing municipal harbor plan. Um, there's really strong protections um, to protect the harbor and the water. That plan was um, led from a conservation perspective. And I hope that the next version of the plan uh, can consider the cultural resources as well. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that we would that we would advocate that we identify the historic resources in the harbor area that we include additional protections for significant structures we would advocate uh, for new developments to respect the rhythm of the downtown core. Um, this would, of course, just complement protections we already have as a, a, a historic district. Um, we would be particularly concerned, especially with large new developments, that they not overwhelm the uh, traditional downtown, the historic downtown, um, that our historic downtown remains the gem of Nantucket um, that it is now. Um, we would also advocate for the identification and protection of view sheds and cultural landscapes. Um, Ultimately, what the Historical Commission is working towards is an island-wide preservation plan. Um, so why do we need a preservation plan on Nantucket? Uh, I hope um, I've made it clear through this talk that you cannot protect what you haven't identified and planned for. So a preservation plan will identify and catalog historic resources on the island, including archeological resources, it will describe and evaluate the dis distinctive characteristics of different areas of the island. It will make recommendations to the town and the voters for continued preservation of what is historic and important about our national historic landmark. Um, it would be developed as a companion piece to the Nantucket Master Plan. Um, it would apply the goals, strategies, and recommendations of the Master Plan to preservation um, and appropriate treatment of historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes throughout the town. Um, and the oversight and development of a preservation plan would be part of the planning department. Uh, we would be, you know, a, a consulting group to that. Um, so in summary, I know everyone's had a long presentation here, so I'll wrap it up. But in summary, preservation planning includes identifying, evaluating, and protecting historic resources wherever they are. Um, Nantucket does have an independent commission that advocates directly to other commissions, boards, elected officials for preservation, and that is the Nantucket Historical Commission. Um, and I think that this work is directly relevant to planning for the development of our harbor areas. And I'm very um, excited for this next year um, for updating the Harbor Plan, for including cultural resources in the Harbor Plan, and for having a lot of public participation in that process. Thank you. Hillary, thank you. Um, the Municipal Harbor Plan or the Municipal Harbor Action Plan has been referred to over and over again. I want to tell attendees it's available online on the town's website. Uh, one clicks on government, then departments, uh, natural resources, and right on the natural resources front page is a list of the various plans for which they're responsible, prominent of which, of course, is the Harbor Plan. So, Hillary, thank you. Let me turn to our last speaker. And let me uh, say that at 5.30, the formal presentations will have finished. Uh, if speakers will stay with us, we'll try and capture a few questions. And those who have questions, raise your hands now so that as Arthur Reed is speaking, uh, I can assess how many we've got. Arthur Reed Jr. is our next speaker. He's practiced law in Massachusetts since 1965. He started practicing in Nantucket in 1973 moved here full-time in 1985. His practice is concentrated in real estate law 
including conveyancing and important to us land use matters. As a result, he has had many occasions to advise clients about the chapter 91 licensing process as it applies to Nantucket real estate that they own. And of course, as an attorney to provide representation and connection therewith. I first met Arthur um, in sort of close proximity when we served on a jury together. And I have a great deal of respect for his legal acumen. Arthur, it's yours. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, the, the respect is mutual, I have to say. Can you hear me all right? We can. Good, because I've been having some trouble from time to time with being heard uh, on, uh, on Zoom calls when I come in later in the meeting. When I'm taking on the representation of someone who is either buying real estate in Nantucket or embarking upon a construction project of any type, I obviously have to take into consideration the uh, potential land use issues that relate to that property. And on anything that's anywhere near the water, I have to take into consideration whether there is any involvement with Chapter 91 licensing. Now, the Nantucket waterfront has been greatly manipulated by uh, residents of Nantucket ever since European settlement. And the result of that is that the um, uh, water lines, as they show on the historic maps that have been promulgated, uh, are, uh, are very different from today's water lines, as you've seen when some of those maps have been put up on the screen by previous speakers. For example, uh, during the whaling days, there were uh, several uh, very large solid fill piers that were constructed. Uh, what's now Steamboat Wharf, uh, uh, Old North Wharf, uh, Commercial Wharf, Straight Wharf. And uh, these structures, which were used for uh, commercial and clearly water dependent purposes when they were first constructed back in the whaling days, after whaling became uh, no longer a, a central activity in Nantucket, uh, ceased to be um, used for those water dependent purposes and other things developed. And for example, on Old North Wharf and Straight Wharf and the area in between on the Still Dock, a number of structures, residential structures uh, sprung up probably during the latter part of the 19th century and have been added to, uh, uh, replaced, um, and uh, uh, rebuilt in some cases throughout the period since that time. And without any particular consideration of the fact that any type of uh, licensing procedure would be required. In many cases, uh, I have been involved with several of them on Old North Wharf, the uh, houses were reconstructed. Uh, the Conservation Commission issued an order of conditions for that. Uh, obviously the DEP uh, wetlands uh, division uh, received notice of that and uh, nowhere along the line did the issue of chapter 91 licensing get identified. And this is even in relatively recent times before Jeff Carlson's time, I will have to say, because if Jeff saw something walking in without a license today or without uh, knowing that a license was in the works. I think he would uh, let some people know that they had some work to do. But the point is that uh, there are a lot of structures down there that should have licenses and do not have licenses and are inland. They're not separated from the uh, uh, water by a public way because the, the uh, uh, passageways down there are not public ways, so we don't get past that exemption. And the, uh, these houses, in most cases, take up virtually the entire lot that they're on. 
Uh, they don't have any uh, ability to provide any form of public access. And they've been in uh, residential use uh, throughout the entire period of their existence. Uh, the, there are other areas where um, I know the people with the Dreamland were greatly surprised uh, when they found that they had uh, chapter 91 uh, uh, issues, uh, that the um, uh, historic water line came in that far. Uh, there are other areas on, on Easton Street where you have the same issue and you have the situation of the historic water line uh, jogging in and out um, uh, along Easton Street so that some properties down there are entirely outside jurisdiction and others are almost entirely uh, inside and in any event severely affected by it. The result of that is that we have to take a very close look in order to determine whether there is jurisdiction and if so to proceed with licensing, particularly if anyone is planning to do any work uh, and inevitably these days when anybody buys property in Nantucket, uh, it seems that they have a compulsion to do some work, even if there's an existing uh, house on the property, whether it be an addition, whether it be a replacement or whatever, uh, these issues come up and we have to consider what licensing will be necessary in connection with them uh, and, uh, and go through that process. And obviously it's very important in that situation that the issue be identified usually comes from the lawyer. It sometimes comes when you bring a surveyor into the situation, but uh, the lawyer should identify it. And more and more, we're trying to educate the real estate brokers who are dealing with it. But uh, uh, this is an issue that people need to take into consideration. It's important to work with uh, uh, DEP waterways on all of this. Um, Obviously, uh, we, we know and understand and have to advise people that uh, regardless of what the nature of the property is, that if there's any ability whatsoever to provide public access, that it's got to be provided. Uh, we had a situation uh, with a uh, uh, tidal stream uh, out uh, in, in Pulpus, uh, which nobody really had thought about as a stream or as a waterway, but it, it's actually a, a tidal inlet and it had a bridge over it, which was built fairly recently and was unlicensed. Uh, and we had to figure out a way to get that licensed in order to be able to sell the property. Fortunately, I had the opportunity to get some input on it from Ben Lynch at uh, DEP back at that time. And uh, we worked out the ability to have a public access for, for anyone who might be rowing a kayak or canoe through that creek uh, who might be obstructed by the bridge particularly at high tide, to be able to go up some steps that we put on each side of the bridge in order to walk over it. Uh, and that was the public access that we provided with a public access sign right next to the bridge. Uh, I found that working with the staff at DEP Waterways, that it is, uh, that they're, they're, they will help wherever they can in dealing with it. Uh, but uh, variances are uh, very, difficult to obtain and understandably so. The um, history of the structures on, on, on the lot is something that we have to take a close look at because uh, again, uh, there, are, there are many situations where uh, you would assume that the house had been built back at a time when you wouldn't have to worry about dealing with licensing. Uh, which has come into uh, uh, play much more, in, in much more in recent years. I mean, for a long time, it was completely disregarded. And uh, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, rules and the laws changed in various respects. And uh, uh, it, it, it now is very much in play on, on everything. But we need to determine whether the house that's there is a house that was there 100 years ago and would have protection or whether it's something that's been reconstructed without a license uh, since, um, uh, since then in recent times so that we would need to 
go out and get and get licensing. But again, it's very important to identify these issues and to then engage proper uh, engineering and survey consultants to work with the client and uh, uh, determine what can be done and what can't be done. Uh, I think that pretty much covers it. I know we're running rather long, so I think I'll uh, cut off at this point so that we can get into the Q&A. Arthur, thank you. Um, Alan Reinhardt and I are both members of the Cemetery Commission. We're neighbors to that bridge. The Pulpit Cemetery is, is, is a neighbor to that bridge. Yes, it is. We, we're familiar with it. Thank you. Uh, question and answer. Uh, Fred, I've got two uh, raised hands. The first one is from Stephen Lenbach. Can you hear me? Hello. Lineback. I'm sorry, Stephen. Lineback. Yep. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Okay. So my question is for Carlos at uh, DEP. How does how does the state interpret or determine the mean high water line on on properties, and and how do they how does that work with rising sea levels and erosion? Does that mean high water line? Is that a moving target? Or is that predetermined by some old map? How, do, how does that work? It's a great question. The regulations have the same definition under the Wetlands Act as they do, I'm sorry, under the, the regulations as they do in the Chapter 91. So it's mean high water is based on an 18.6 year average. It's a metonic cycle based on the national title datum epic. I think the NOAA agency can explain it better than I can, but it's just a series of mean high waters that will need to be updated for another 18.6 years, or maybe it's done every year, I really don't know. So it's a mathematical exercise. The easiest way is just to guess, if you're a lay person, to say, where's the rack line? What's the average rack line? I know there are high higher rack lines than others, but it really is not high tide. High tide's more of an annual, but, but on the CHAP 91, it's not an annual thing. It's like I said, that's the close to the 19 year cycle. And so that might answer the other question. Whoever's doing it, I don't know who it is exactly, but I know I've gone to know our USGS folks sometimes know the answer. And we send our engineers up, we send proponent engineers up there and consultants. They might be updating based upon those uh, resiliency standards because of the rising levels of water. Does that answer your question? Kind of. I guess it sounds mostly like it's a common sense thing. Mean high water has been my understanding is average high tide, not a not a neap tide or a spring tide. And I guess you kind of just look at the, the average high tide line. Right. It's not going to be accurate if you do that, because the way you do it is you go and you figure out where this 18.6 year cycle is. And then you do the calculations, which I don't do, <clears throat> but I but I ask the engineers to do them. A lot of engineers and surveyors will cheat. They'll go out using a tide chart and hopefully they use the right one and they'll take a stanchion, put it in the water at low tide and then they'll see what the tidal range is for that day and say, okay, it's gonna be 3.6 feet from low tide and they'll go out and shoot the lines. That's not really the way to do it. Okay, thank you. Car Car Carlos and Stephen, thank you. Our second question comes from Rick Atherton. Which means? Hello, Rick. Rick, are you there? He's muted. Ah, I've got a note that says, tell him to unmute. Because Rick, if, if you can't come on in the next 10 or 15 seconds, we're gonna move. Ah, I think I just found it. All right. I knew you were a clever guy. Yeah, sir. Um, thanks, Lee. You know, I just have a uh, question in a general, and I'm not sure who's best to answer this. Maybe, maybe Arthur. <laughs> if a citizen wanted to find out um, how many uh, new license requests were made or modifications of 
licenses under Chapter 91 were made on Nantucket in the past six months or something like that, where's the best place to go? You would assume there's just a, a, a simple file someplace that would have that information for every such license being processed. Let me, let me I don't have an immediate answer to that, but I suspect that Carlos does. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I think the easiest thing to do is to contact the DEP, my office, or maybe in Boston. I don't always have great database access. We have databases. Unfortunately, Chapter 91 has been around for so long that we don't have a great handle on things, but newer licenses we can probably help you out with. We have a database where we could create a report based on dates and then give you a sense for what's been filed. It may not be easy to figure out exactly what type of project. We do, we do have that information, but, it, but sometimes it's a pick list and people don't always understand what additions are versus extensions to a doc, et cetera. But if you, if you give a, um, a general question with then some specifics, we might be able to help you out. The other way is to potentially go to the Registry of Deeds That would, of course, relate to uh, existing licenses rather than applications. I'm, I think Rick was going more to the point of uh, what's been filed by way of uh, applications. I think that's right. Can, Lee, can I follow up maybe for a second? Uh, so, for example, I noticed, uh, Carlos, when you put up those forms for the zoning officer and the planning officer, it, it made me think that for each application or modification, that form would have had to be signed. And you would think there would be a simple file of those forms and you'd get a local answer. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, the same thing applies. So sorry, I missed the question, but basically there are numbers associated with all the applications. Chapter 91 is unique in that you have to be very specific, but yet give as much information as you can. There are three different application numbers or numbers that are issued for Chapter 91. There's only one for wetlands. There would be a transmittal number, which follows the money. Then there's, and that creates action. And then there's an application number, which shows completeness of the file. And that could go on for a year, depending on the person decides they want to continue. They haven't given the information, but they want more time to wait, et cetera. Or they just haven't responded for some other reason, and we haven't kicked them out yet. And then there's the license, which is another number that can be searched. So those are the ways you search. So if there's a new application that comes in, yes, we'll search our database for the transmittal number. We can look at the address, we can look at the applicant name, but we don't have a requirement for who is the applicant. It could be a subdivision owner, like in wetlands, sending in one subdivision name with six different properties under it. You never find it. So keep that in mind. You wanna give as much information as you, hand, as you can, give as much information in terms of who the person is that filed, or any company, the person that owns the property now, that kind of thing. Otherwise, you might end up with a, a false sense of security. You might think that you've got all these new applications and some might be missed. Also, applications come in, but they don't get logged until they pay and get cleared by revenue in Boston. So it could be around for a month. We've had that happen where people don't give us the money and we just don't act on it. Right. Another thing, Rick, is that in almost every case, uh, there is going to be an order of conditions that will have been requested from the Conservation Commission. And, in, and the, uh, when those notices of intent uh, come in, first of all, you can obtain information about them from the Conservation Commission. And as you know, they're also um, uh, advertised in the paper uh, for the first public hearing on the NOI. So uh, I, I think that may be a, a, a sideways way of getting the information on anything that may be coming in. Yeah. All right, uh, 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 I'm going to interject here. Uh, thank you. Now, it is, uh, we've reached the advertised end, but I've still got two questioners. Um, and so I'm going to ask the panelists if we could take another four or five minutes to see what they have. Uh, if they're elaborate, um, we'll, we'll look at um, offline conversations. So Phil Smith, uh, Frank, Frank will. Uh... Uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, I hope this isn't too elaborate. Just a quick question. 
I understand that these licenses have a uh, expiration. I've heard uh, 99 years, 30 years. Uh, what happens, do they automatically renew? And if they don't automatically renew, uh, somebody has to actually uh, proactively get them renewed. And if they don't, what are the consequences? Thank you, Phil. That's uh, a Carlos? very good question. Very good question. There are 10, 15, 30, 65, 99, and no term. And then municipal projects are unlimited. They're all, there's a full range. Once the license term expires, that's it, you have to file again. So you wanna, the answer to the question is you have to renew the license. There are also interim approvals which expire after 30 years. And we get a lot, of, we have a lot of those coming up. Those interim approvals aren't really licenses. They're actually just authorizations that say once you buy a property and it's out of the family for some nominal fee, then they would have to be converted to licenses. So the renewal process for a simplified license is you pay your fee, you send the old plan in, send as much information as you can, and then we, we send out a new one. With a, a Chapter 91 license, it really becomes a new license, but you want to do it beforehand before it expires, so it's not a violation. So a new, so there's no renewal form for, for a Chapter 91 license. There's, I think it would be an amendment if it's an existing structure, no substantial changes, but the amendment really just gives you another term. So that's just a different mechanism to get what you want. So that's the answer. I, I hope I, I didn't make it too, too muddy, but there's an amendment that, that would go for a, a regular license, an O1 license, the one you saw with the forms. And that one is you, know, you pay your fee and we advertise and then you, you continue on. The simplified license, same thing. You, it's, just, it's just something that doesn't need an engineer to be done. There's also something called the general license certification. That's interesting because the term changes every year. It was already authorized and put on the reg every register of deeds in that town. So if it's Nantucket, it would have an inland and a coastal license, general license that has been recorded. And then when you, you get the certification, the DEP will send it to you to record against and marginally reference that license. It was issued several years ago. So in a 30 year term for coastal general license certification is now only 25, 26 years old, you know, worth of term. The inland one was 15 years, so that's only 12 years. So that's an interesting twist. Thank you, Carlos. So I'm close to wrapping this up. There was another hand raised. I'm looking at the list of attendees and that hand is down. Um, so let me just ask very specifically, Art Gasparro, did you have a question? Yes, you did. Uh, Frank, Arthur Gasparro. Uh, thank you very much. I, I did, but for the sake of time, I could um, just follow up with Mr. Fregata, unless you would like me to get into it. Okay, Art, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up with one uh, question for uh, both Carlos and uh, Stephen. We want, the purpose of this forum is to educate the public. Uh, the public, if they're interested, will watch the YouTube or they will turn uh, to our local uh, support, Department of Natural Resources, Conservation Commission. However, we need to learn from others. Do you have examples of good public education programs that might have been sponsored by other waterfront towns. I know that DEP has got a very complete website. We've, uh, we've all consulted on it in preparation for this, but I'm looking for uh, best, best examples of education. That's my question. Education specific to chapter 91 or Sort Dr. of broader, yes, okay. Um, yeah, that that's totally in Carlos's wheelhouse. Sorry, no more questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because I haven't seen that many. I know CCM is really great at doing things. So I, no, I'm just kidding. They are, but I'm just kidding. To okay. The uh, <clears throat> the resources we have are really pretty thorough. We do have presentations presentations we've done. And we could maybe share the slide sets. 
Okay. Carlos, thank you. Stephen, thank you. Uh, my other speakers, Alan and Jeff from the town, Hillary and Arthur, uh, also from the town. You have my commanding respect for the great job you've done. Uh, I'm going to turn to our co-presidents, Charlie Stott and Peter Morrison. Do you have any valedictory uh, words to say? Not from me, Lee. Peter? Uh, Peter is muted, which means he doesn't have any valedictory words either. <laughs> and so I'm going to suggest uh, that we're done. Uh, you may sign off. I will be leaving the meeting and then clicking uh, close all. Frank, is that appropriate? Sounds good. Okay. Thank, thanks to all of our presenters. Thank you. Yeah, By the thank way, you for having us. At the peak, Thanks for having us. We had 54 attendees. Carlos, would you send me those the that what you just mentioned so I can put that in as part of the record? I'd appreciate it. Send what in particular? The uh, the slide things you just mentioned about a minute ago, the additional stuff, the best practices. Anything else you think would be helpful? Good examples we can follow. Yeah, I think I'll have to use the FTP site because they're usually PowerPoint presentations, but I can send. Sure. Anything you deem worthwhile, just uh, try to get them to me and I'll see that they're put in as part of the record so we have them going forward. Right, and I'll, I'll talk to my supervisor, see if he's okay, okay. with sending sure. it. But we've done these things in public, so All right. it'll be okay. And thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.